In tonight's Dorchester segment, we'll look at results from Tuesday's election for city council, as well as controversy over commercial space in Cobbin Square. To bring us up to date is the editor and publisher of the Dorchester Reporter, Bill Forey. Thank you very much for being with us, Bill. Thanks, Chris. But we'll start with the uh, large race for city council. It's well known that Michelle Wu came in first place, but you had a candidate from Dorchester who came in second. Tell us about her. Yeah, Anissa Asabi George, who's now on into this will be her third term uh, coming up. She uh, she's continues to be impressive, actually, in, in, in the growth she's shown each election cycle. Of course, the first time she ran, I think it was uh, 2013, she, I don't believe she won. She came in fifth or sixth. She's, she's really excelled since then um, and, and obviously joined the council and then has grown in the last two cycles. So I saw her, you know, I was watch, looking at her number stay. She won 21 precincts outright across the city. And then she came in number two a lot of places. Like she was everybody's second choice, it seemed, in, in parts of the city that were surprising to me. She's shown a lot of growth in West Roxbury. She's so, shown some gr growth in Roxbury as well and in Mattapan. She was coming in one, uh, one, two, or three in places in Mattapan. Um, most places, Michelle Wu was one, of course, as we know across the city, she won much more, many more precincts than anyone else. But Asabi George was right behind her in, in many of those places. So she's a strong two, and uh, she's making a case. We, we covered her election night party, and she was talking to her volunteers about how two's great, but she wants to top the ticket next time. And that, that's her ambition. Uh, I think it's also her ambition, Chris, and probably some other councillors right now thinking the same uh, to mount a candidacy for uh, city council president. Andrea Campbell's term will be ending at the end of this um, council cycle, and um, Anissa Asabi George clearly is going to be one of those candidates. With Asabi George, I, I think of the issues she's most uh, connected with, uh, especially the opioid crisis, yeah. the schools. Um, she seems to be fairly aligned with the mayor, but none of that seems mm -hmm. to explain why she did so well. Why do you think so? Right. I think she's quietly been building a base that, that's well beyond her Dorchester um, space. And that she came out, when she first came out, she really was kind of a Dorchester candidate, and that was it. But she has grown, and, and education's been another key thing. So people who are really invested in the public school system and are engaged and are active, they see her as, a, as really carrying the ball for them on many issues. Um, and she, and on other issues, she's more moderate than, than the field. She's, uh, she's uh, not for rent control, for example. So there, there are places where she's getting tweaked by people on the hard left about she's, she's too moderate. And yet she performed quite well, as did Michael Flaherty. Uh, he came in third, about a thousand votes be behind Asabi George. But clearly there's still a, a good chunk of the electorate that's looking for something a little bit more moderate. Uh, you mentioned rent control. Uh, three of the four candidates endorsed by a group that's against rent control got elected, and yes. nine out of ten uh, candidates endorsed by yeah. a, a, almost the opposite yeah. kind of group got elected as well. Yeah. So, so what do you see that it's a big, to? It's a big tent. It's a big tent group, and these are all obviously Democrats. They, they're on different parts of the spectrum, perhaps, with possible exception of Althea Garrison, who is an outlier, but, um, and it showed on, in this election. But, um, but many of these candidates were in, in, aligned on most issues, and then there'd be places where there were differences. I think the electorate, and especially in a city, you know, an off-year municipal election for council is pretty well tuned in and, and pretty well versed in what these people are, are about. Uh, and they have a, they also have an a la carte menu of, of issues that are important to them, voters. So I think it's a, it, it's a fairly diverse group of, of people in terms of their beliefs. Well, this is the, the first council, uh, at least starting in January, that will be majority female, in addition yeah. to being majority people of color. Uh, yeah. One of the things I noticed certainly during this, it, this wasn't just about individual female candidates running. This is about people sometimes teaming up, yeah. creating a chemistry. W what yeah. did you see in that? Well, that's another place where Anissa Asabi George was interesting, because she wasn't really teamed up with, with other women, with other candidates, and, uh, council candidates. She was kind of running her own show. The mayor endorsed her, um, but uh, to your point, you know, she, she's somewhat allied with him through, throughout her career. Um, what I saw was, you know, it, 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 there were some hits and misses with that. Obviously, uh, uh, Alejandro Saint Guillen currently is in fifth place and, and won't get a seat unless the recount that's, that she's mounting is successful. Um, so she was ticketed up really with Michelle Wu and with Kim Janey, and it, that was a, kind of an unconventional um, approach, a sitting incumbent picking another, a challenger really, um, to, to, join, to join forces with and have somewhat of a coordinated campaign. It was unusual. It may not have worked. Um, 
But, you know, it, she came within 10 votes at least, maybe more. In the preliminary uh, election, uh, uh, Alejandra Sanguillan came in fourth. Julia Mejia wasn't all that far behind her. No. But, uh, you know, Mejia came out 10 votes ahead of her in the unofficial count so far. Uh, uh, what do you think was going on there? Well, I think Mejia really was, was capitalized on many of the people who didn't make the cut in the prelim went to her. Um, Priscilla Flint Banks went, or, you know, she endorsed her. Domingo uh, De Rosa endorsed Julia Mejia. And they actually became part of her team. And they were, they were functioning as volunteers on Tuesday. So some of those people who were coming out of communities of color um, really kind of um, joined forces with Mejia. And not so much with St. Guillen. There was some. And they were, they, they, there were certainly some crossover votes, a lot of crossover, crossover votes for two very good Latina candidates. Um, but in Roxbury, Dorchester, and parts of Mattapan, where the, the African American electorate in particular tended to go to Mejia, and that's borne out in the precinct results that we were watching Tuesday night. Places like Mildred Ave Community Center, Mejia was in the top three or four usually in these precincts, sometimes topping the ticket actually. And then St. Guillen was coming like sixth and seventh. So she wasn't as strong as she needed to be in um, African American, predominantly African American precincts. And she did very well elsewhere, but. Um, you know, this is the kind of a city right now, you, you need to be able to get into the top four in these precincts in communities of color. Of course, what is also going to happen next year is there's going to be a new city council president because of term limitations. Yeah. So uh, what do you see shaping up for that? Well, certainly I mentioned Anissa. Anissa Asabi George has already told us, told her volunteers that she's interested in running for that, and I think she will. I've heard that Councillor Frank Baker's interested. I think there'll be others. Um, uh, Matt O'Malley is a fr frequently comes up. He's, a, he's now, frankly, like the veteran, uh, almost the dean of the council next year because he will be, I think, the longest uh, serving um, other than Michael Flaherty, but Michael Flaherty had a uh, had an uh, interregnum there that he wasn't in on the council. So I think you'll see multiple candidates um, in the next week. This is BNN News, uh, and we're talking with Bill Forey from the Dorchester Reporter. Bill, turn to uh, uh, District 5, which is yeah. uh, an open seat. Uh, you have Hyde Park, most of Rosendale, part of Mattapan. Uh, Ricardo Arroyo won, but what did you see in the way the, bre uh, the, way the vote was spread out? Well, there, there are 30 precincts in District 5, and Ricardo Arroyo won uh, 22 of them on Tuesday, beating uh, Maria Esdale Farrell. Farrell was coming out of the base, really, of, of the current city councilor, Tim McCarthy, who's, ba who's based in Hyde Park, as is Arroyo. Uh, both of them are from, from Hyde Park and are really invested in that community. So the battleground extended beyond into Rosendale and into Mattapan, which were both, uh, both important parts of this district. Arroyo really cleaned up in Roslindale and in, in, um, and in parts of Hyde Park and in Mattapan. Mattapan was a bit of a low turnout, though. And then the battle in Reedville and other parts of Hyde Park, which are kind of McCarthy's base, Farrell did very well. She, she won eight precincts in that side of the district. And the vote total, even though Ricardo Arroyo won by about nine percentage points, the difference in actual raw vote was only about 900. So it, it was a fairly competitive election. I actually thought it was more competitive than I thought it was going to be. Arroyo really, after the prelim, he came in the first place in the prelim and then got all, pretty much the endorsements of almost all of the other candidates who didn't make the cut right, right away, um, earned, earning him front runner status. And, and the, he was the favorite all along, really. Uh, Farrell, though, put up a good, a good showing on Tuesday. And to her credit, she's a first time candidate just as he is. Um, she acquitted herself well. Uh, in, on, on her own terms, but Arroyo really had an advantage here, and, and it, it's not just because of his name. Uh, Ricardo Arroyo is a very accomplished uh, public defender. Uh, he's 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 eloquent, really, in in the way he frames his arguments, and he has he has an energy. Um, he's a very strong candidate. He's somebody to watch. He's going to make an impact on this council right away. Right. Bill, turning to some of the other uh, news, uh, you, you've been following a story in uh, Cobb Square, which is, I think has been described as something like uh, a, a mixture of uh, uh, gentrification, chicken, and, and zoning here. So uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, try to disentangle it. Well, what's going, why is this such a big controversy? I know, it really, it's, it's gone on much longer than we expected this to go on. Um, Popeye's, you know, the Louisiana chicken chain, um, has been, had its eye on the corner of Kenwood Street and Washington Street, actually built out the store th almost three years ago now, and it's been sitting there because the Zoning Board of Appeals in Boston 
really at the behest of neighbors who were who were not comfortable with this chain. They, th there's a there's a group in Carbon Square that's uh, the neighborhood council that's vehement about they want to steer away from fast food. They don't want. Um, unhealthy food op options um, to proliferate. So they're trying to hold the line here on this particular store, and it's a really hard line to hold. It's, you know, legally. Popeyes uh, appealed the ZBA rejection that they got three years ago now in 2016, and they were successful. After a long legal battle recently, they, they won basically an injunction and, and a decision that says, yes, you, you are as of right to, to be in there. The neighbors were unhappy because they felt that Popeyes kind of circumvented the community process. And I think even Popeyes would say, and their lawyer would say, yeah, we, we didn't do it right the first time. But now we're back. We have all of our, you know, all of our permissions in place. We just need to get one last permit from the city, and they're likely to get it. But this community meeting earlier in the week was was fractious. It was it was contentious, um, and a lot of people feel very strongly that it's the wrong direction for the co for Common Square. Uh, uh, correct me if I, if I, if I misinterpret. It looked uh, from your article in your paper, uh, not at least not in yours, but your reporter's article, as if uh, Popeyes uh, won in court because the changes they made in this commercial space. We're not dr dramatic enough yeah. to qualify as a zoning. It activity. was or, it was as of right is their argument. It was already a restaurant, so they weren't they, they didn't have to really go through too many hoops to to reopen. They just needed to get some some standard permissions, uh, and they didn't get them. Um, and now they probably will. Frankly, it, it, we expect this to be resolved probably by the end of the year. Now, uh, somebody at the meeting accused them uh, of uh, calculating the demographics. I mean, I think every restaurant does that probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if they think they can make money selling, you know, fast food, fried chicken, um, what, what's wrong with it? I mean, there must be people in the neighborhood who want that too. There are, and, and clearly there were people at the meeting who who said, "Well, listen, you know, we, we've had this discussion now for three years. It's pretty clear they have the right to do this, and we." we should allow them to do it. And if, you know, let the market bear from there. If people don't want to eat there, they won't eat there. Um, there, is, there is an argument from the neighborhood council side that's compelling about there has been a kind of a food desert in, in parts of Dorchester. And, you know, that was true with supermarkets. It was true with banks at one point. Um, things are changing. And uh, Cobb Square is right in the epicenter of a lot of that change. So uh, Popeyes became a flashpoint for it. And uh, I think it's, it's probably going to get resolved soon. Uh, turning to a, another topic involving uh, civic groups in Dorchester, yeah. when they're not busy battling over commercial space, uh, there's going to be a, a summit that yeah. uh, City Councilor Andrea Campbell is organizing. What's the purpose of that? So, uh, City Council President Campbell has been doing this in District Four for for most of her terms now. She's been convening civic leaders monthly uh, to talk about what's going on across the district, and it's been, I think, a useful tool for her and for others who, who do this too uh, to build some consensus and get a sense, get an early warning system of, of what issues she should be paying attention to. She's going to take this to, the, this is actually going to be a citywide summit. It's, um, it's going to be held at the JFK Library and the EM, EMK Institute. Um, I believe the date is November uh, 24th. And it's going to be held on a Saturday so that people can, can attend. Uh, it, the purpose of it really is to, to, I think from her point of view, try to get to best practices and try to, try to get a sense of what's going on all over the city in terms of civic groups, their, their influence over city in city government, their role in participating in city government, and how they can be better equipped to, I think, bring in more people. Some of the civic groups have, have there's been some attrition in membership. There's been some, perhaps some, um, some groups that just don't reach out as well as they could. And I think that's part of it too, is to find best practices, bring that to a citywide level. Uh, Councillor Campbell's been very good at this, and it, it showed on Tuesday in her, her election results. She had an opponent, Jeff Durham, who uh, made a critique of her that she was a little bit too much focused on downtown. The numbers on, on Tuesday showed she, she got about 90% of the vote in a contested election, which is remarkable. Um, so she's kind of taking her brand of community organizing, taking it citywide in, at the JFK Library and EMK Institute. Uh, you can find out more about this online at dotnews.com. And um, I think it'll probably be a, a fairly good turnout for this event. And finally, uh, one, one more time, Bill. Uh, the turnout this year, I think it was what, 16 and a half percent for this. 16 and a half, which is up from 11 percent in the prelim. And then I think you, you've done some research too. Yeah, it, it, I think four years ago, the last time we had election for council without election for mayor, it was something like 13.65 uh, or something like that. So hmm. it's moving in the right direction. It is still low, but yeah, you, you're right. It, it, that, it, that's a good sign. All right. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Chris. Bill Forey from the Dorchester Reporter.